Okay, here we have some skin that has a really severe amount of sun damage. You can see that the dermis, which is normally made of pink collagen, has been replaced by this thick layer of blue-gray solar elastosis. And these are elastic fibers that have accumulated over many years of chronic um, ultraviolet exposure, usually from chronic sun exposure. And you can see here, see how there are these little thin blue-gray squiggly uh, little fibers here. Those are elastic fibers and they get compressed into this thick layer. So um, in my practice this is kind of like normal for a, because a large number of uh, the, the patients that I end up seeing biopsies or excisions from uh, have had many many years of sun exposure. So we get so used to this this is almost like normal but this is actually very abnormal. This is not the way skin should be. I just see it uh, very often. And here, um, so that's the skin that's, um, that's just got solar elastosis, but over here there's um, an ulcer. And you can see that the, um, the epidermis disappears and it leaves this thick layer of kind of uh, crust and scale and, and neutrophils all, um, all on top of uh, the ulcer. And at the edge, you can see the epidermis starts getting thicker and kind of more pink and glassy and, and has uh, this reactive change. So you might wonder, well, what happened to cause this ulcer? Let's go over to the other side of the ulcer. We'll keep tracking over here. And there the ulcer ends there. Well, without being given any history, I can tell you what happened to this ulcer and the, or to cause this ulcer. And the clue is right here. There are two things that you should look for. First, you can see these bright kind of uh, purpley pink or magenta colored collagen bundles. These collagen bundles have been damaged. And what they've been damaged by is aluminum chloride, which is a chemical hemostatic agent. So this is kind of basically chemical cautery. A dermatologist has done a shave biopsy here. It was probably a cancer. Uh, I think it was a squamous cell cancer in this case. And um, then after they did the biopsy, they, they put uh, aluminum chloride topically on the wound to stop the bleeding. And that aluminum chloride works well to stop the bleeding, but also it leaves some very telltale histologic features that can tell me that this has been biopsy biopsied and had aluminum chloride applied. So when I see these things, I know that there's been a previous biopsy here. This wasn't that just someone scratched their skin. Now usually we're given that history, but it's really nice to be able to recognize biopsy site changes. So I think that this, uh, for people who are not familiar with it, they might wonder what are these magenta colored kind of collagen bundles, but these are like basically burned by chemical. And if you see cautery used by electrocautery, it gives you the same kind of change, this kind of distortion of the collagen bundle. So here's more of it, this kind of uh, funny uh, purpley pink color. And you can see that the hair follicles have been sliced right across there by the, by the original biopsy blade. And there's this thick kind of layer of uh, dying fat and, and collagen up here. And um, the other thing that you find with uh, chemical cautery, let's go over to the other side, I think there's some a good example over here is that in addition to these uh, magenta dyeing collagen bundles, you see these large, puffy, kind of granular gray blue histiocytes. Let's see if I can get it to show up here. So these histiocytes, they look like they almost have little gray-blue particles in them, and some people have even said that this reminds them of uh, the parasitized histiocytes that you see in leishmaniasis or histoplasmosis. I don't personally think it looks much like that, but I can see how if you weren't familiar with this, you could be confused. And um, these, uh, these granular, um, granular and large cytoplasm of these histiocytes is another great clue that there's been aluminum chloride applied here, and again, it, it tells you that there's been a biopsy, that this was not just someone who traumatized their skin, but actually a biopsy was done and aluminum chloride was applied. So this is what normal biopsy site change looks like. So the way I would sign this out, I think, like I said, I think this was a squamous carcinoma and they did an excision. So I would say no residual tumor identified and biopsy site changes are present. So that's usually all that I mentioned. But I find that a lot of times, uh, uh, residents or other people who are not familiar with this will get kind of disturbed by these funny collagen changes, by these abundant histiocytes, and sometimes in you know melanoma excisions, people can even confuse those large histiocytes with melanoma cells. Mel melanocytes can look quite a bit like histiocytes, so you want to be careful to not make that mistake. Also, don't be surprised if you find giant cells in here. The giant cells are trying to clean up that dying collagen. So you'll often see multinucleated giant cells. And here's another view of these kind of granular, large histiocytes that again, they're, they're histiocytes that are engulfing the aluminum chloride. And here's a different slide from the same case. 
You can see large sebaceous glands over here, so there's some background sebaceous hyperplasia. You can see the reactive changes of the epidermis at the edge of the biopsy site. And you see again these degenerated, burned looking uh, collagen bundles that have that bright magenta color. You see histiocytes. Look, see that histiocyte is a big nucleus and kind of a punctate central nucleolus. If you uh, were uh, not familiar with this, you could get confused and wonder if that might be a melanocyte or a, a melanoma cell or something like that. So you gotta, you gotta really learn to recognize all these funny little changes that we often take for granted. Sometimes they're the only thing that you have on the biopsy or on the excision. And if you're not familiar with all the little variations of normal or benign things, sometimes you'll be tempted to, to misdiagnose those things as cancer. So you gotta know all of the little features like that to avoid uh, making a misdiagnosis. And I think I, I put this slide in my, uh, my stack here to show you because again, it's got really nice granular change in these big uh, histiocytes with abundant granular cytoplasm. Look, mitosis too, that's okay because there's a lot of reactive reparative change happening at a biopsy site. So it's totally understandable that you're gonna have some mitotic activity there. You're gonna have granulation tissue formation. All those things can kind of look a little scary if you're not familiar with them. And I think in here, if uh, there's more of that uh, chemical cauterized uh, collagen, let me see if I can find it. Ah, yeah. The other reason I wanted to put this slide in is look at this. So this is not, oh, let me show a lower power. These little islands of kind of funny looking um, squamous epithelium here, these are not actually squamous cell carcinoma. These are reactive, what we call pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, or reactive epidermal hyperplasia. So I find that um, this can be a little bit tricky, and sometimes I even really struggle to tell reactive epidermal hyperplasia from uh, squamous carcinoma. So uh, one way to, to get used to this is when you have an excision of something that's not a squamous cancer, like say a melanoma, make sure you pay close attention to all the variations of reactive change around the biopsy site. That way you can get a good feel for, you know, in the setting where you know that it's not going to be squamous cell carcinoma or that it's very unlikely to be because, you know, they're excising a melanoma. You get a, a chance to see all of the weird uh, reactive squamous changes because squamous epithelium when it's reactive can look very scary, very atypical, and it's very easy to misdiagnose it as carcinoma if you're not paying attention. Um, and even if you are paying attention, sometimes you can. So I think that the very irregular shape of the islands, and also I think this is another useful feature, the fact that, see the solar elastosis gets kind of entrapped and kind of taken up in the middle of the epidermis. So the, the uh, reactive squamous uh, proliferation pulls the, um, the elastosis or the collagen fibers and kind of wraps around it. I find that pretty helpful and I, I see that often in reactive um, squamous uh, proliferations. And see, look, you've got a kind of a funny looking mitosis there. So you can have some things that would scare you if you're not, um, if you're not familiar with how weird uh, reactive uh, changes can look in squamous epithelium. So this is kind of a basic simple thing and doesn't seem very exciting, but this is the kind of bread and butter stuff that you have to look at all day long. Sometimes in pathology you see case after case of this and it's really important to be familiar with all of these uh, changes and make sure that you don't uh, misinterpret them. Let's go to low power here. So here's a skin biopsy from, I think it's from the leg. You can see this is a, a nodule. They've kind of had a pedunculated nodule that they've shaved off. And the whole surface, uh, the epidermis is mostly ulcerated and replaced by a thick layer of purple pink um, crust. So crust is the kind of scabby stuff that you see clinically. It's made uh, microscopically, a uh, scab or crust is made of fibrin and neutrophils usually, and sometimes some parakeratosis mixed in. So a closer look, the bright pink is uh, fibrin um, from the, the serum. The blood's kind of leaked out and all of the fibrin is coagulated to stop the bleeding. And then all those little dark specks you see in there, those are all neutrophils. So tons of neutrophils. And so this is what we often see on top of any sort of ulceration on the skin. And then also sometimes you can even see little uh, Little, it's a little hard to show here, but little purple bacterial colonies. And um, depending on the setting, I don't get too worked up about those little purple bacterial colonies because they're, they're a normal component of skin flora that overgrow the surface of any ulcer. Um, there are some settings where I, where I pay attention to those. 
but most of the time that's just kind of an incidental finding. So let's go back to lower power and see what's actually going on here. So when we look down in the dermis, let's go to real low power. First of all, the epidermis looks very thick and, and looks like it's kind of growing downward and also you could, you could really start thinking that this might be like a squamous cell carcinoma that's really ulcerated and inflamed. And this is actually not squamous cell carcinoma. This is another example of reactive pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, reactive epidermal overgrowth in response to an inflammatory process. And um, one clue is the presence of these kind of collections of neutrophils that are trapped within the epidermis. Um, or within the squamous epithelium. So I think whenever I see that, you can see that in squamous carcinomas, but anytime I see little aggregates or pustules filled with neutrophils trapped down in the middle of kind of a thick, glassy squamous epithelium, I always stop and think, is there any chance this could be infectious or reactive rather than squamous cell carcinoma? So it's worth taking a closer look. Sometimes I'll do a fungal stain or something because there's a variety of things that can cause reactive epidermal hyperplasia that can really closely mimic squamous cell carcinoma. Let's see if we can figure out what's causing the reactive epidermal hyperplasia here. And there we have it. These are little perfectly round, thick walled structures that are kind of a brown color. Uh, these are actually fungal uh, organisms. So these are called, um, people uh, call them uh, sclerotic bodies or medlar bodies. Or um, if you want to be kind of funny, you can call them copper pennies because they look like uh, uh, American uh, coins, pennies that are made of, that have a copper coating. And so here's some more of them there. And these are actually dematiaceous melanin producing pigmented fungi. And there's a variety of species that can, um, of uh, pigmented fungi that can involve um, infect humans. And uh, one of the, the more common ones uh, here is um, Exophiala wernickii. Uh, or I think Fonsatia Wernicke is an alternative name for it. I always forget which one's the more recent name. But there's a variety of others and they vary depending on where you are in the world. But um, this is called chromoblastomycosis. And chromoblastomycosis is actually not the name of the fungal, fungal species or, or genus, but it, it's just the pattern that when we see these, these um, copper penny looking, these, uh, these pigmented fungal, fungal um, round organisms that we call this chromoblastomycosis. And these often are from traumatic inoculation, like you're you know, out working in your garden or something and you, you uh, get your, you know, your foot or your leg stabbed with a, a dirty stick. And then these fungi live all over in the environment, at least in, in my part of the world where we have warm weather and a lot of rain and a lot of damp, um, wet um, wood material outside. So there, a lot of things are covered in um, these fungal organisms. And if you get stabbed with it and get a penetrating injury, then the fungal organisms can start to grow kind of opportunistically within the dermis. And there's a lot of inflammatory change and then all this reactive squamous proliferation over top of it. So when you see this pseudoepitheliomatous reactive change with a bunch of inflammation, particularly neutrophils or, and or granulomas, always look around and see if you can find some pigmented fungi. So if they are these round um, uh, spore-like structures that have, um, that have the uh, brown color, we call it chromoblastomycosis. Sometimes you see pigmented hyphae instead of these round uh, sclerotic bodies. And when there's pigmented hyphae, we call it pheohyphomycosis. But chromoblastomycosis and pheohyphomycosis are both um, basically skin infections by dematiaceous pigmented fungi. And they both cause this reactive epidermal change. And they're both caused by a variety of different um, uh, fungal species that produce their own pigment. So you can see that the, the, um, the fungal organisms are actually being kind of exuded here in the, um, in the exudate that's coming out and draining out of this wound or out of this ulcerated lesion. And let's see, they're usually often in, embedded down in the dermis and also within these little cysts. So when you see the, the kind of cystic area with a bunch of neutrophils, always look closer on those areas. See, there they are. There's some, there's some there. You look over there, there's more, and there's also some histiocytes forming little granulomas around them. So that's a useful place. Look where the neutrophils and where the granulomas are because that's often where you'll find the fungus. So here you don't even have to do any special stains. You can use PAS or GMS, which will stain these fungi. You can also use Fontanamasan, which is a melanin stain. It's a silver stain that turns melanin from brown into black. 
but you don't really need that here. These are really obvious even on H and E, so you don't have to do any special stains. But if you if you're struggling to find organisms, there are other non-pigmented forms of fungi that can cause epidermal reactive changes, particularly like blastomycosis. And so you can use special stains sometimes in that setting. And again, here just more uh, just amazing example, floridly infected with um, these brown fungal organisms here. See if I can get the light adjusted so you can see the brown color a little better. And uh, the, they're fungi because they have real thick walls and they're perfectly round. So I find that really helpful. The, the really sharp delineation of the, the organisms I think is helpful in de determining things that are actually fungi versus other mimics. So a real nice example of chromoblastomycosis. <clears throat> All right, here's a shave biopsy of uh, sun damaged skin. And uh, clinically, they were wondering if this was a squamous cell carcinoma or an actinic keratosis. And you can see that the skin's abnormal. Their epidermis is acanthotic and thickened. You've got kind of a thick layer of ortho and para keratosis over top of it. Um, so it looks like there's some abnormalities there, but it's a little bit hard to tell. It doesn't seem quite like actinic keratosis. It looks actually like the granular layer is thickened, and a lot of the keratin is actually orthokeratin without retained, um, retained nuclei. So rather than a bunch of parakeratosis, much of it's compact ortho. So that's kind of almost like lichen simplex chronicus, like from chronic scratching. So you could be wondering, well, why does this person have this single lesion? And I think that the clue, though, is not in the center here, but as we go to the periphery of the lesion... we find this. And here we have kind of this um, little stack of parakeratosis. And right underneath it, we see some, uh, some uh, pale cleared out keratinocytes and some dying keratinocytes. So this kind of funny vacuolation change and this little invagination here that the stack of parakeratin is coming out of. So this is called a coronoid lamella. And uh, this is a good example of porokeratosis. And porokeratosis is, is relatively common, and sometimes it's hard to, to diagnose if you only see the middle of the lesion. You'll often have a variety of kind of reactive changes. Sometimes there's uh, acanthosis and thickening like this, and lichenification and reactive change. Sometimes there's atrophy. Sometimes there's a little atypia. The dermis oftentimes has fibrosis and inflammation. So I find that often on these biopsies, I'll be scratching my head saying, well, the epidermis is abnormal, but I'm not really sure what category to put it in, and then at the periphery I'll find a coronoid lamella. And that's a really useful finding. That's what you really need to find to make the diagnosis of porokeratosis. See here at this edge here, here's the coronoid lamella. You've got this little tower of scale. Oftentimes it kind of leans back. The parakeratin kind of leans back towards the center of the lesion. And underneath it, um, usually there's this kind of vacuolation change and occasional dying keratinocytes. So it's really important not just to find a little tower of parakeratosis, but to find that little vacuolation and dying keratinocytes. And porokeratosis clinically is a little ring, a little scaly ring. So if you shave the whole thing, you should have one uh, corneal lamella at one side. And if you go all the way to the other side of the biopsy, if you're lucky, you'll find the other one. And we're lucky in this case, they've shaved around the whole thing. Now, not always do they get the whole lesion in the shave. Sometimes the shave is a little off-centered or depending on what section you have, you might not see both sides. But if you find both, it's perfect. So here again, we have an invagination of the epidermis. We've got a tower of parakeratosis kind of coming out of the top and leaning back. And then underneath, you've got the dying keratinocytes, these little pink guys down here, and the little kind of uh, white or clear vacuolated keratinocytes also. And <clears throat> let me show you from low power. See, so from low power here, we've got one corneal lamella over here, a bunch of kind of reactive change in the middle, and then all the way to the other end, there's the other corneal lamella. And I like to think that this is like an old-timey steam engine, like a train that's uh, steaming out from the, the middle of the lesion, and it's got a tower of smoke trailing back behind it towards the middle of the lesion, like, so f like from back in the Wild West in the old days when we had steam trains that made lots of smoke. So maybe that doesn't work for you, but I kind of like that visual, so that's the way I think of it. And here, look at this piece here. Again, we've got the same kind of thing. We've got one 
cornet lamella over on this side. In fact, we kind of have two. Sometimes you get a couple cornet lamella. It's not always a perfect single lesion, but you sometimes have the, here's one cornet lamella here. Here's another one right here. So we have kind of two of them together, a bunch of reactive change in the middle. Oh, there's actually another little cornet lamella. So sometimes you can have several of them uh, kind of close together. They don't always make one at, at each end. But when we go over to the other side of the shave, again, you find another one. A little tower of parakeratosis, vacuolation change, dying keratinocytes. So this is porokeratosis. And it's a pretty common thing. And I find that a lot of times they, they give me trouble until I find the cornered lamella and then I say, ah, it's porokeratosis, no problem. So uh, a nice, uh, useful thing to know about in Dermpath. So here's another example of a biopsy site. You can see the normal skin over here and the uh, site where the shave biopsy had previously been done here. And uh, you can see that the, the dermal collagen has this nice bright pink color in the normal dermis and it's got these thick bundles of collagen. But even from low power, you can tell that there's a zone here that's disrupted. This doesn't have normal dermal collagen. And that's because it's been scooped out with a little shave, a, a razor blade. And you can see, see there's a little bit of the residual dermal collagen here, but all this stuff is, is filled in with those uh, aluminum chloride filled histiocytes and also some granulation tissue. And you can see again very nicely that the um, uh, bundles of burnt kind of degenerated looking collagen that's starting to kind of calcify. And um, as it gets a little older, it starts looking a little bit more kind of a bluish gray color. And then we'll have those uh, bright pink purple kind of areas in it. And um, the histiocytes also sometimes begin to stand out. Um, they, they, this looks a little different um, in early uh, recent biopsy sites versus a little bit older biopsy sites. And eventually it goes away and is replaced completely by scar. But I like this one because the histiocytes here really do, you can see these really large discrete histiocytes with abundant cytoplasm. And the granularity is a little hard to show on video, but if you kind of look at this, um, at the microscope, you can see that there's actually like these little kind of refractile particles. So this kind of pink to uh, grayish kind of colored histiocytes that have a granular cytoplasm that sometimes can have, the little granules can almost mimic, um, like they can mimic the organisms of leash mania or things like that. Um, so you don't want to get it confused with that. I think it's actually really helpful though to know about this because when you see this, like I said before, right away you know that this is, you're dealing with a biopsy site, the, the burnt, um, chemical cautery kind of artifact in the collagen, and then those uh, histiocytes. So another example of a biopsy site uh, change in a, in a subsequent excision specimen. And yeah, there's more of it right there. So now if, you're, if your dermatologists don't use aluminum chloride, say they use something else like um, Moncel's solution, which is uh, in, in um, in my area, people don't use that as much. That'll leave actually this kind of golden, um, golden orangey brown pigment that looks a lot like hemocytor, and that's because that's made with um, um, an iron uh, preparation, and so it looks different, but it um, is not used as often anymore, it seems. All right, and then also we have a little bonus over to the side here. So this isn't at all, I think this was a re-excision of a, a melanoma, if I recall. But now here to the side, we see this incidental lesion. And so we often see this kind of a scenario um, when we're seeing excision specimens, we'll find a variety of little other lesions in the background skin. So that can make uh, excision skin be kind of boring sometimes if they're negative and there's nothing there to look at. But if you find little background lesions, that's kind of makes it a little more interesting, at least if you're a Dermpath uh, nerd like me. But what you can see from, from low power here is that there's a little bit of increased keratin on top and the cells are starting to fall apart. So we've talked before, that's acantholysis. And you can tell that the granular layer, the purple part, is definitely thickened. So even from low power, you can see there's acantholysis, there's hypergranulosis, there's hyperkeratosis in this one little zone of skin right here. So we look closer and we can confirm that. Let's see here if I can get the slide to move, there we go. So again, the, the cells are starting to fall apart and become acantholytic. And we're beginning to see this really thick, blobby kind of hypergranulosis. And so this kind of really thick purple hypergranulosis in this setting is actually almost like a pattern of dyskeratosis. So this basically is acantholysis plus this kind of unusual form of dyskeratosis, or that's the way I think of it at least. So this is really just kind of a, a different presentation of Grover's disease. And it doesn't, um, you know, it looks a little different than uh, some of the other more typical examples of Grover's disease that I've shown before and that um, a lot of people are familiar with from 
from books, but I find that this, when I start seeing a little bit of acanthalysis and this really thick, very uh, dark purple granules and some increased keratin, if I ever find that like on a punch biopsy, I think, oh, this is probably Grover's and if I'm not sure, I can cut deeper. Here, this doesn't matter. This is probably someone had a melanoma on their back and they just had a couple little papules of Grover's in the background and this is an incidental finding we see all the time. If they only have a single lesion, you could actually call it focal acantholytic dyskeratosis if you want to be fancy. I usually actually, if I'm going to say anything, I say it's just a pap of Grover's disease. In a case like this, I actually wouldn't even mention it because it's just an incidental background finding. Uh, in this case, the way I would sign out the report is I think if it was a melanoma, I'd say biopsy site change identified and no residual melanocytic proliferation identified or no re negative for residual melanoma, something to that effect. So that's all I'd say and I don't really give comment on the little incidental background things like Grover's disease. I just think they're fun to, to show to my students and residents. Okay, let's look at a different, um, a different lesion. So this was a, um, a papule and it was umbilicated. I mean, you, you can see clinically that means it had it was a little bump that had a little divot or a little depression in the middle. And you can see perfectly on this nice section here, you can see this was a papule and in the center it has a little depression, a little umbilicated area. And we'll look down in the dermis in a second here. And here's the deeper level on it, on it. And you can see that that little umbilication, that little depression, invaginates down and makes this proliferation that goes down into the dermis. And it's made of keratinocytes. See, those are keratinocytes. They look just like the epidermis. You can see they've got a little layer of spines there. See, little spinous processes. But these keratinocytes have a problem. They have these huge pink smudgy blobs in the middle of them, these large round um, eosinophilic um, globules. And then they also have, they also have thick, uh, large, chunky purple granules, uh, large granules as well. But the, the most important thing is not those granules, but these pink blobs. And you can see the pink blobs are starting here in the keratinocytes and they're kind of uh, being exuded out and in the, and kind of being secreted out into the center of this uh, invagination. And so these are called Henderson-Patterson bodies. And of course, if you've seen this before, even once, probably you recognize it right away. This is molluscum contagiosum. It's caused by a pox virus. Um, and it's, um, it's a, a benign um, a a viral process that usually affects kids, although sometimes can be seen in adults. And I think molluscum is, is pretty straightforward and easy once you see the, the Henderson-Patterson bodies, but it can cause some problems in a few settings because um, here's a good example. Sometimes you'll get this. What if you had this as your initial section? All you see is this papule and there's a big area of inflammation. And when you go closer, all you can see is abscess, just a sheet of neutrophils. So you might struggle with that and think, is this infection? Like, what do I need to do? Should I do special stains for infection? I've seen examples of molluscum that were very, very densely um, lymphocyte rich, and they really actually made us think of a lymphoma at first, and then we cut deeper sections and found, you see it? It's hiding right over here in the edge. See, that's like on an exam, right? They'll show you something, and then at the very edge of the screen, they'll be the important thing. So always, you know, when you're taking a test, always check uh, around the edges of the picture uh, and make sure that you're not missing something, there's a molluscum body. Now I know just one by itself, you might have a hard time convincing yourself, but if you even think about molluscum, look around more. And then the other problem is that the keratinocytes in molluscum can become quite atypical because they get this kind of reactive change. And I've definitely seen cases that at first looked like um, squamous cell carcinoma. They looked like they were kind of nests of keratinocytes that were atypical invading down into the dermis. And then deeper sections showed molluscum bodies. So even though molluscum is real easy and straightforward when you see, see a classic case, I've definitely seen a few times where it was very tricky and it caused some problems that could have really made a diagnostic, uh, a diagnost have diagnostic significance. I did see one where it was actually called atypical squamous proliferation, and there was concern that it might be squamous carcinoma. And it was a, it was a child actually, and we saw the case in consultation, and we thought, yeah, I agree, it looks very atypical. We're concerned about it, but something about it gave me this feeling where it kind of looked like it invaginated and kind of had a cup shape. So even though I didn't see molluscum bodies, I thought, you know, I wonder if this could be molluscum, and we got the block and cut deeper and lo and behold, it turned into molluscum. So I think it's one of those things where um, it can be pretty tricky, but look at those. Those are Henderson-Patterson bodies or molluscum bodies. They're basically aggregates of viral particle 
um, from this pox virus. And molluscum can rupture and get very inflamed. It can have lots of neutrophils, lots of lymphocytes, can cause kind of some atypical squamous cells. Um, I've seen it, see like right there, from low power, you might think that could be a little focus of invasive squamous carcinoma. And then you can see though, it's got these pink molluscum bodies. So nice example of molluscum contagiosum. All right, so this is a great example of a wart, a Veruca vulgaris. There are a lot of different types of warts and we could probably do a whole video just on warts um, because warts are common, we see them a lot and they can, they can occasionally um, be diagnostically tricky but I think um, this is a real classic one. You've got nice um, papillomatosis, that means finger-like projections of the epidermal surface. So each of these little fingers, those are, that's called papillomatosis. Above the lesion, you see a thick layer of keratin and the keratin is kind of accentuated over the tips of these papillae. And what's nice, if you go closer, what you'll find is that the keratin here has some alternation. A lot of the keratin on the top of a wart will usually be orthokeratin, dense, compressed, pink keratin without retained um, nuclei. But when you look over the tips, what you often find is kind of stacks of parakeratosis. So see over the, over the top here, you can actually see there are retained nuclei. There's parakeratosis here. So some people call these church spires because they look like the tall steeples on top of, um, of some, uh, some older churches would have those. So that's a name that people have given before these kind of church spires of, of parakeratosis. And the parakeratosis has this tendency to kind of accentuate the tips of these uh, papillary uh, uh, papillae. And then in between, you have a lot more orthokeratin. So I find that one useful feature. We got papillomatosis, these finger-like projections is useful. The presence of parakeratosis accentuated over the tips of reedy with a lot of areas of orthokeratin in between, that's useful. Another feature I really like for warts is hypergranulosis. So the granular layer in a wart tends to get really thick. And not, not only does it get thick, but the granules start to kind of coalesce together and become very large and thick and chunky. So large, big purple granules. Now you can see this in other settings. I just showed you in molluscum, you get um, hypergranulosis that's kind of thick and chunky sometimes. In lichen simplex chronicus from chronic scratching or rubbing, it can sometimes produce granules that look like this. So this is not a perfect finding, but that's why I'm teaching you all of these individual features because sometimes if, if a wart looks classic like this, you can diagnose it from 2X, no problem. But sometimes warts can be a little more subtle or they can be irritated and inflamed and have some atypia that could get you a little concerned for a, a squamous cancer. And so recognizing all these little features can kind of help you when you're having to sort out a more difficult case. See, even here where there's this only a little tiny papilla, you can see there's this little uh, tuft of parakeratin over top. And then in between, there's more orthokeratin. Now, when warts get really irritated, they tend to produce more of that parakeratin. And then another feature I really like for uh, warts, let's see if I can find it. Maybe it's better up here. Ah, it warts, warts don't look very pretty on your skin surface, but microscopically, they're quite beautiful. And these are all those little papillae. They're just cut at a funny angle, kind of tangentially cut, so they look like little islands floating out here. But in the, within the kind of the uh, dermis, the core of these finger-like projections in the papillary dermis here, what you often see in warts are these dilated capillaries. So those dilated capillaries in the, in the, papillae, in the dermal papillae going up inside of these papillary projections is very useful, I think, um, another useful feature for warts. So you'll often see those dilated capillaries. And what will happen is that as the tips of the, uh, the papillae get traumatized or begin to kind of... Uh, convert into to parakeratosis, what you'll often see is that you'll get a little bit of blood and uh, fibrin collection that gets kind of exuded out of the tips of these papillae and caught up in the surface. See, even up here, there's a little bit of a, a papillary projection left and it's still got a dilated blood vessel in it. So those dilated vessels are useful and they often produce hemorrhage. So there you can see that's a little bit of hemorrhage and it's caught up here in the corneal layer. And what this looks like clinically is little black dots. Those little black dots you'll see in a wart, they're little, these little um, uh, hemorrhages that are coming out of the tips of each of these papillary projections. See, there's more there. There's blood engorged vessels in a kind of a dying uh, area that's come off the tip of one of these papillae. There's a fibrin, little bits of fibrin there. So those look like little black dots clinically. And sometimes 
um, uh, lay people will ca call these seeds. And I think that this confusion comes from the, um, the idea that plantar warts, warts that occur on the surface of the foot are called plantar warts. But I think lay people don't recognize that, that plantar means the sole of your foot. So they think planter, like someone who plants seeds in the ground. And then they think that these little things are seeds and that these seeds will, um, will, um, you know, that you can catch the wart by touching these seeds. So even though warts are viral and actually are contagious, so they're kind of right for the wrong reason, but th these are not actually seeds. These are just little focal punctate hemorrhages that you see. But that's, I don't know if that's really why people, people will often call them seed warts, but I think that that's, that's the reason. Because I've had people explain to me, lay people say, oh, those are little seeds in the wart. Don't touch the wart, you'll get those seeds in you. So anyway, uh, papillary surface projections, parakeratosis over the tips of the papillae, hemorrhage in those little um, uh, tufts of parakeratin, dilated vessels in the dermal papillae within the papillary projections, hypergranulosis, all those features for wart. And then the one other feature from low power is this what we call in towing or inward pointing of the reedy. The edges of the wart, the outer edges, have this tendency to kind of slope as they go down and point back in towards the middle of the lesion. So you can, you can see out here, this reedy, instead of going straight down, it's pointing towards the middle. These reedy over here, they're pointing back towards the middle. So this kind of inward curvature of the more peripheral reedy ridges at the outside of the wart, really useful feature. I actually find that pretty helpful if I'm struggling between, say, wart and seborrheic keratosis, which doesn't matter because they're both benign, but I think that that's a, that's a helpful way to kind of tell those apart. And in this case, we have a bonus. I think this is actually a case of a wart with an adjacent seborrheic keratosis. Because look, if I just showed you that, you'd say, oh, that's perfect seborrheic keratosis. It's got hyperpigmentation, it's got horn pseudocyst, kind of a, a flattened bottom. And then right next to it, we've got um, a wart. So a lot of times I think that some, you know, sebs can kind of look like warts and vice versa, but I think here we probably really do have two lesions. If I recall, that's actually how I signed this out. I said, this is a Veruca vulgaris with an adjacent seborrheic keratosis. And clinically, that was what their suspicion was, that it looked kind of like a wart and kind of like a seb. And I think that that explains why, because there are two processes here. So that was kind of just a fun case. I think warts are actually pretty to look at microscopically, um, but maybe I'm weird, but that's you know why I'm a derm path, so. Uh, okay, let's uh, see something else. All right, so oh, the, the lesion here is not really important. I wanted to show you something incidental, something that we see all the time and we don't even usually comment on. Here's a di This is a sun damaged person. You can see that almost the entire dermis here is replaced by thick solar elastosis. And here's a really large dilated hair follicle. So this is probably on the face. And within this hair follicle, we have something kind of interesting. And if you've never heard of this before, it might disturb you a little bit. These are Demodex mites. So we've got like a little family of mites. These are actually little arthropods. Um, uh, and they, I guess you could think of them like parasites, but they don't actually harm you. They just live here in your hair follicle. And what they're trying to do is eat the sebaceous secretion. See the sebaceous uh, glands here? Those cells die off and get secreted out into the follicle. So you can see right there, the sebaceous gland drains into the follicle. And these demodex mites, see here's one mite, here's two mites, three mites, that's probably the little tail of a fourth mite up there. So it was a whole family and they, they were all living happily in this follicle until some dermatologist came and, and shaved them right off with a biopsy. And, and, uh, and that was a sad ending for them. But in any case, these little mites were just here with their little heads down in the follicle, just trying to, to live happily and eat some sebaceous secretion. These mites do, you know, if you're watching this and you're kind of paranoid about parasites, let me be clear, this, these mites do not invade your body. They just live in the follicle. And technically the inner, per, uh, the inner lumen or portion of the hair follicle is technically outside of your body. See, it connects with the outside world there. This is inside your body, past the epidermis and the dermis, that's inside your body. But this is outside. And if, say, your follicle ruptures, these mites can sometimes spill into the dermis, in which case they die. They cannot live inside your skin or invade your body or anything like that. They just live up on the surface and they tend to live right there in the follicle. If we go closer, you can see these are some of their inner organs and I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know actually what all the different little body parts are in there, but they're kind of, kind of cool to look at. And then see this, there's one leg, two legs, three legs, four legs. See, we've got little, we've got little legs there. 
and the, the head is kind of down here. We can't really see the center of the head because we're cutting at a funny angle. So if you see these funny things in follicles, that's what you're, that's what you're looking at. This is Demodex folliculorum. There's also a smaller version that lives deeper down in the sebaceous duct, and that's called Demodex brevis. Um, so if you're really into entomology, there's probably a, a whole uh, world of information to know about demodex mites. In, in the vast majority of cases, these are almost like commensal organisms. They just live on our skin and live off of our secretions from our sebaceous glands, but they don't cause us any harm. Occasionally people do, um, if they have a whole bunch of these mites, some people think that if there's a lot of them, they can contribute to making rosacea worse or causing some kind of a rash uh, type of process from your body's immune system. But I think the vast majority of the times that's not the case, and so I almost never even comment on these unless the clinician is specifically asking me, hey, we think maybe this patient has demodicosis, you know, overload of demodex mites that's causing a problem. And if you want to be thoroughly disturbed, you can uh, look on YouTube for demodex um, and you can actually find videos of these scraped off the skin and crawling around. But um, I will warn you in advance, it might disturb you. So if you're, if you're prepared to see that, go and have fun. But if not, you might want to might wanna skip uh, searching for that. But that's what Demodex is, and it's an incidental finding that we see. But I think knowing all these incidental findings is important, because otherwise you might find that and think, what is this thing here? And that's just a Demodex, a Demodex mite.